it's time to start. So uh, let me remember our notation. So we have a point X in our N, capital N. Here we do not distinguish a special variable time with respect to the others for the moment. Um, and then we, have, we are considering the following uh, PD sum uh, one to n, the i of x, u over the xi, uh, plus uh, c of x, u of x, equal f of x, the u of x, equal f of x, where uh, we know that uh, the coefficients bi and c are sufficiently smooth, huh? and also f is given and is sufficiently smooth. And uh, we have given also a, a hypersurface sigma, sigma uh, smooth hypersurface. And then we have found a way to solve uh, this, uh, this problem coupled with uh, u equal u bar on sigma say an hypersurface contained in omega, omega an open subset of our n, then we are considering this in omega, in omega, and this on sigma, and the, at least uh, for, well, depending on, on the PD that we are considering, but at least around sigma, uh, we were able to find a solution of class C1. So, but the exercise, that I gave you the home homework was this. Uh, so um, x1, the u over the x1 plus 2x2, the u over the x2 plus the u over the x3 equal to 3 times u. And then uh, this is, say, in uh, R3, say, maybe. And this uh, u equal u bar. u bar is a function of x1 and x2 because u bar on sigma, which is x3 equal to zero, OK? So u bar actually is a function of x1, x2. So did you solve this? Uh, did, you, did you find? Could you please let, tell me the, the solution that you had? U bar. U bar, yes. U bar, let me see. X1 multiplied. Is this? No. X1 multiplied by e power minus x3. Minus x3? Yes. Comma. Comma. 2 e power, e power uh, minus 2 x3. And multiplied by uh, exponential 3 x3. So let me check. Uh, this is correct. Yes, it's correct. So, uh, but but I would maybe was everybody able to do this? Maybe it is better that I try. I do it here. Is it okay? So I, I correct it here. So this is correct, by the way. Uh, so we we are in the following situation. We have n equal to three. Sigma is this uh, hyperplane, okay? By the way, this is, again, in, in a more standard, maybe more standard notation, this would, would have been written as follows. Huh? Uh, so this is the u over dt plus, uh, in a more standard notation, maybe like this, say, b of x rad u of x equal to 3u. 
where now the notation means that this is the gradient with respect to x1 and x2. B is equal B1, B2. So this is, of course, a different notation. But you see, um, usually such kind of PD uh, are written as follows. But anyway, this is a, a notation maybe more similar to the first lecture. So let, let me come back to this one. So n is equal to 3. So b1 of x is equal to x1. b2 of x is equal to uh, 2x2. b3 of x is equal to um, 1. c of x is equal, with this notation, c of x is equal to minus 3 is a constant, and f is equal to 0. OK? This is the situation of the PDE. Of course, when I wrote here, now I have erased, but this b was a different b with this. You see, now this b has three components. But this, in this, in this way of writing the PDE, it has only two components. Well, I'm using the same symbol, but it is clear what, what I'm meaning, OK? Anyway. So b has three components, uh, c is constant, f is equal to 0. So let me rewrite down the uh, system of characteristics. So x dot is equal to b of x. Uh, y dot is equal to, uh, now I think it is minus um, c of x y. OK, uh, well, but, but c of x is constant. Anyway. And then I have x of, well, dot means e over ds, uh, x0 and y0. So this is a vector uh, with uh, x1, x2, x3. Uh, this is a scalar object. And x, x now x0, say, let me call this just a point x bar on sigma. And this is just uh, u bar of x bar. Hmm? This is the system of characteristics. Okay? So now this can be written more explicitly. Um, So x1 dot must be equal to x1. x2 dot must be equal to 2x2. And um, x3 dot is equal to 1. Oh, it is clear, by the way, that the, the, tra the important transversality condition is satisfied. Before doing this, maybe it is better to recall that uh, uh, this vector field, as usual, has uh, so b of x is equal to x1, 2, x2, and 1, which is, of course, uh, uh, transverse to the horizontal hyperplane. Hmm? because uh, the, the, the sigma is, uh, is just this, uh, is, a hyperplane, is a plane, sigma, horizontal. And uh, b of x has the third component, which is always 1. So b of x is something here, but never parallel to sigma. So we met the, the important transversality condition between the vector field b and the given hypersurface sigma. So B is transverse. To sigma. <coughs> then we. What's the difference between plane and surface and hypersurface? Um, with difference, uh, could, could you repeat, please, uh, the difference the between plane a plane and hypersurface? <coughs> well, uh, first of all, plane. Uh, uh, is a sort of a special uh, case of hyperplane. So when we are in n dimensions, hyperplane means an ob a flat object of a dimension n minus 1. So it's a generalization of a plane in space. 
okay? Then, so what is a hyperplane? Or in this case, the plane, because here we are exactly in three dimension, it is clear. Now, the hypersurface uh, is, um, is, the, <laughs> is a sort of uh, plane, but that is, uh, is, a, is an object, is, is a surface, say, which locally, around any point, is like a plane via a map, an embedding map. Uh, meaning that uh, locally, so, well, the definition is uh, sort of this. If at point P in sigma, so this is sigma, it means that locally there is a map from an open set U into, say, if this has n, if it, this is n minus one dimensional, or for instance, two dimensional, then there is uh, a map phi from an open uh, set over two, say, uh, into p, into sigma, uh, such that phi of u is equal locally uh, a neighborhood, say, a neighborhood n intersection of sigma. So it's just a piece, a local piece of your object. But And phi, say, in this case, say, is uh, c1. And uh, it has a differential which is of maximal rank. So uh, it's sort of is a called uh, an embedding. So you take a small disk and then you deform it into a big higher dimensional space. And then you require that uh, if you do this with another phi, psi, then you require that there should be some compatibility condition between the two local parameterizations. Um, you, you, you have to think about a sigma like an object which is locally very, very similar to a plane, just a little bit deformed, okay? Okay, so this, but, but this, this is not a problem here because our sigma is really a plane, okay, in this, in this exercise. Hmm? Um. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, therefore, x1 of s is equal to x1 of 0. Say, and x1 of 0 is a point, let me call it uh, x1, small x1, uh, x1 e to, the, e to the s. x2 of s is equal x2 of 0 which is, let me call it, maybe x1 bar. So x2 bar. Um, e to the 2s. Huh? And then x3 of s must be equal to uh, s and must be equal to, uh, well, simple s. Okay, because at time zero, s is equal to zero. Okay, so this is the solution to our first uh, part of the characteristic system. So this is solution of s and this. Next, we have to, to solve for y. So you see y of s. So y of s is, uh, this c was minus 3. So this is equal to e to the 3s times u bar of x bar. So this is the solution to our second, so remember the system of characteristics consists of three equations. Now this is three equations. And this is just one equation, OK? Vector and scalar. OK. 
so we have now, remember, the delicate point here is now to invert the map. Because we have the solution x, we have found explicitly the solution, which is a solution of depending on what? Depending on s, of course, and on x bar. Hmm? And then we have also y, which is a solution depending on s and on x bar. Huh? <coughs> Again, you see, uh, the, third, the third variable can be identified in the previous language with time. So now we have the following map, say, S x bar into x S x bar. Hmm? Which is a local diffeomorphism between uh, uh, a rectangle here, sort of uh, minus delta delta around, uh, in this case, around uh, sigma. And then a tubular neighborhood of its, Im its image, hmm? a, a, a neighborhood, so its image. Hmm? And is the image of this uh, rectangle through this map, which can be inverted, by the way. So any x can be obtained as s of x and x bar of x, if you want, in a unique way. So we have, and then the solution, remember, uh, u of x, the characteristic uh, teach us that, uh, that uh, the solution is y of s of x, x bar of x. So we have, uh, we have to write down this. So we have to explicitly invert this. this. So we have to solve. So we have to solve the following. So x1 is equal to x1 bar e to the s. x2 is equal to x2 bar e to the 2s. x3 is equal to s. And so we, we have simply to, to uh, find s and x1 bar and x2 bar in uh, dependence of this. So, uh, so you see x1 bar is equal to x1 e to the minus s, but s is equal to x3. x2 bar is equal to x2 e to the minus 2s. Uh, equal to x2 e to the minus 2 x3 and uh, s is equal to x3. So you see now um, given, uh, given x given x we find s of x x1 and x bar of x. This is x bar of x. So given x, I have f s of x, which is equal to x3, and x bar of x, which is this. And so uh, our solution, so u of x, which is equal to y, of s of x, x bar of x, is simply equal to, now, u bar, equal to u bar. So first of all, there is e to the 3s, 
but s is equal to x3. Okay. And then there is u bar. X bar 1 is equal to uh, x1 e to the minus x3. And x2 bar is equal to uh, x2 e to the minus 2 x3. So this is our initial condition. And this is the solution of our problem. And which is correct is exactly the, 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 the same that he said before. Okay. So you see the importance of the, the method of characteristics. So remember that uh, for all the PDs that we have studied up to now, meaning essentially, essentially we have studied the following. Let me change a little bit the notation that I prefer. So let me, but we understand what this means. Huh? U plus C of Tx U equal F. Uh, for such a kind of uh, linear first order PD with this new notation, uh, we are able to solve it uh, using the method of characteristics, OK? I hope that this, for the moment, is OK. So now uh, so let me do some remarks concerning what it would be interesting to do in connection with this PD, and that we, that we will not do. But just a comment to give you uh, a view, a, a large view, a more, a more, a more large view on, on, on what, what are now the interesting problems related to this. Even if this is, of course, this is a linear PD, first order. So maybe this, the simplest you can imagine. Hmm? However, still, there are difficult problems. Uh, one of the problems is that it becomes rather interesting to assume that p, take also f equal to 0 if you wish, eh? and take also c if equal to 0 if you want. So just for this very simple first order homogeneous and without the dependence on the, on the zero order term, just these first two objects equal to 0, it, it, it is rather interesting to see what happens where b is non-smooth. Also B depending only on X, for instance. So when B is not smooth, uh, say, for instance, also B depending only on X, just for, even for simplicity, autonom autonomous case, then what we have said up to now doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work because we were based on the system of all these. Huh? that we know how to solve it, at least when, when b is continuous, yeah. right? Even more, when b is locally Lipschitz, we have uniqueness and so on. Uh, our case was, was, was b c1, actually. So b c1, no problems locally. Huh? But if now b is not smooth, for instance, say, also discontinuous, or, or, not, or less than, than, uh, than continuous, then it is really not clear how even to solve uh, this uh, system of ODEs. And, uh, uh, and therefore, the method of characteristic is not, is not clear how to implement it. Hmm? So this is, this is an interesting uh, uh, further uh, problem related to this, uh, this uh, this first order PD. OK, this is a remark. Uh, why it could be interesting to take B, which is not continuous? For the following, for instance, for the following reason. Uh, we can change and generalize that problem to a quasi-linear problem, for instance, of this form, ut plus u, ux equal to 0. OK, this is not linear anymore, right? Because now this coefficient 
does not depend on Tx, but depend explicitly on the solution itself. Okay? So this is not contained in this. But assume for the moment that you want to look at this as a... Now, it turns out that this equation in general has solutions which are not C1, even possibly also discontinuous. So if U is discontinuous, and if you look to this as a coefficient, now you see that you have Ux against the discontinuous function that you would call, you could call D just for simplicity, even if it depends on you. So you have the problem of multiplying a discontinuous function against something, which is Ux in some sense. And so, I mean, this is somehow understanding this, maybe it is related to also to this nonlinear PD. That is why one of the reasons for which uh, it is interesting. Another remark related to this, uh, this equation. So, the, there are, I mean, there are, the, this means that I'm trying to convince you that there are motivations for a further study of that when B is not too smooth. Just motivations. Hmm? We will not do this here, but there are. Okay. Uh, then, another remark, which is, will remain just a remark for the moment, is that assume that you have, we have uh, just in one dimension, say this. Uh, so the point is that uh, when B is not smooth, what does it mean to be a solution? Why? Well, because if B is not smooth, we expect U to be not smooth. And so if U is not smooth, what is UT? What is UX? In which sense this is, this is in which sense I have to understand this, this, this equality? Because up, up to now, we, there are no problems. There were no problems because UT, U was C1, and therefore UT is continuous. And therefore this is defined at each point and the same is for the gradient. Gradient is continuous. This is defined at each point. And this means that at each point, Tx, this must be equal to 0. So there are no ambiguities when u is c1. But when u is not c1, which is maybe more interesting, what is ut? Well, of course, we cannot, maybe we cannot talk about ut at any point. Maybe at almost any point, if you are lucky, maybe. But not at any point, for instance. And the gradient of U, it's, it's also has the same difficulty. So now uh, you see, when, when this is not smooth, there, 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 there is even the definition of solution is, is not clear. Hmm? Even the very initial definition of solution. What does it mean? You have to declare what is a solution. Otherwise, you cannot continue. So, one possibility to declare what is a solution, now I am anticipating a little bit, but I think it's, it's good for you because uh, this, this uh, put, uh, sh share some lights in the theory of PDs, so it's just uh, an anticipation. So one idea could be, assume that uh, I have this, and let me multiply this by a very smooth function. So let me multiply this by a function phi say, which is uh, C infinity. Uh, so now I don't couple with, with any initial condition. This is a just a qualitative discussion, OK? So, so let me, let me put, multiply this by C infinity uh, function with compact support in space and time, whatever. Yeah. Hmm? So and let me formally do this computation. I multiply this. Hmm? Now everything is formal, and then I integrate. Maybe I integrate, say, in space-time. Hmm? And I have this. Now, you see, now, if I am integrating in space-time, I can, uh, using the integration by parts in time, I can write at least this first part as minus. Now, this is a double integral, in space and time. But first, I integrate in time. So I, I make an integration by parts, and then I integrate in space. So this is minus phi t of u, say. And now, by the way, this is, this is well defined. 
because phi is very smooth, compact support. So when this is defined, at least when u is in L1 log, I mean, this must be an integral in the Lebesgue sense. So compact support, u in L1 on compacts, so L1 log, this is well defined. OK? So for the moment, this is clear. The point is that I cannot do this trick here, because you see what happens if I now integrate by part in space. Now assume we have one space dimension. Huh? So I want now integrate in space. Now what happens? It happens that now I have u, this. But this is not so easy to do, because if b is not smooth, I have the same problems. I don't know what is bx. Uh -huh. So this is another difficulty related to this PD. And the, the point is that this PD is not written in the so-called divergence form. Anyway, this is, this, is, this is, you see, this trick of multiplying by phi and integrate by parts is not clear what I have to do because now I have bx phi times b phi x. b phi x is OK, maybe, but bx phi is not so easy. So what is this? So, and I, I, I mean, the, the, and so, you see, maybe for another equation, ut, let me, let me just, uh, modify a little bit the equation. So let me assume now that I consider another first order PD, or PD where now let me call the unknown rho. Huh? And let assume that v is a given function, even no smooth. But now I assume that my PD has this form, which is slightly different from the previous one. Huh? This is called the continuity equation, given v. Given v. Assume v, v is given, given function. And the unknown is rho. This is slightly different from the previous one. For instance, if I multiply by phi, as before, and then I integrate. Huh? Now the situation is slightly better, because now this is equal to minus phi t rho, and this is equal to minus phi x v rho. Huh? Phi is compact support. Assume that we don't have boundary terms and so on. And, but now these are well defined because phi t is smooth with compact support. Phi x is smooth with compact support. To have a meaning of this, uh, of this uh, is just enough to require that rho is in L1 lock. Rho in L1 lock and v, maybe this product v times rho in L1, L1 lock, whatever, say, both in L2, rho in L2, v in L2. Anyway, for this continuous function, this, this has a meaning, and therefore, it seems to be rather natural to define what is the solution of this. It is an object, a function rho, such that this minus this is equal to 0 for any phi in, the, in that class. So you're looking for generalized solution? Yeah. I'm slightly very anticipating the problem of what, it is, what is a solution and what could be one way to define a solution. These are called generalized solution, more precisely, they are called a solution in a distributional sense, OK? In a distributional sense. I am not very rigorous, but I'm telling you that a solution in the distributional sense ca can be defined as follows. A function rho, say in L2, hmm, such that this is equal to 0 for any phi smooth with compact support. Hmm? You see, in this expression, there are not any more derivatives of rho. All derivatives are on phi. No derivatives on rho. That is the trick. Okay. Hmm? By the way, this trick doesn't work so easily in that case. <laughs> Because this is so-called equation in divergence form. The, 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 the derivative with respect to space is outside. 
And so I can put this x on the test. The phi is called the test function. I can put this x here. But if the derivative is not outside, if I have this term, uh, this trick is not, is not so immediate. Hmm? So anyway, uh, this is just to tell you that uh, um, the theory continues. The theory of, of a linear transport equation is, is rich and continues. For instance, in the direction of no smooth vector fields B. Hmm? Okay. So now, let us continue toward the generalizing for first order PDs. So uh, let me again insist on the, uh, on the previous problem. So you, uh, let me write it as, uh, no, in the, in, the, in the old form. Uh, equal to f. And let, I want to do some geometrical comments on this PD. Hmm? So we are in the previous uh, uh, notation in Rn, so n dimensions, b equal b of x, uh, c equal c of x, and f. So there is no time, uh, special time uh, in, the, in, the, in this way of writing things. OK. So we have the, the, the following. So now, now uh, maybe it is better to, maybe to be slightly more precise. So this is sigma. Now you see sigma is in omega. Uh, this is an hypersurface. Uh, we have always considered a hyperplane. But now assume that sigma is not an hyperplane. It's just really also curved. Uh, so it's, it's an hypersurface. So I need, uh, uh, we know, I need an open set here, u. embedding map, at least local, phi. So um, my notation are to call, so now I have this also minus delta. So this is u, eh? by the way, the, the yellow, the, the, the yellow is u. The, the image is this. Uh, and then I have minus delta, delta. OK. And then my notation, I call this uh, a point uh, sigma, a point here, sigma. And S is a point here. So the, the important map is S sigma into, into X of S and sigma, hmm? which is the difference between this and pre the previous discussion. The previous discussion was that phi was the identity, huh? because sigma was a plane. So phi was the identity and was identifying the, this yellow object with its image. So this is just the difference. But now that sigma is uh, curved, I need to locally describe it in some way, for instance, using a parameterization phi. So previous phi was the identity, OK? Hmm. So we have this diffeomorphism. Let me call this D. So this, this is the embedding map, phi. But we have a diffeomorphism taking this uh, sort of big rectangle of higher dimensional rectangle into a neighborhood of this. Uh, and this, let me call this n, n. 
And so uh, D was a diffeomorphism which was invertible, and the inverse, uh, the diffeomorphism was given by this. Hmm? Capital X was a solution of the system of characteristics. Can you remember? And so this can be inverted, and so on, and so on. OK. Now, let me, so this is the picture at the level of Rn. OK, is it clear? Is everything clear? Okay. It's very important to have uh, to write explicitly the solution of the system of characteristics uh, x dot uh, equal b of x, uh, x of 0 equal uh, a point here parametrized, so phi of sigma. Hmm? So x of 0 is here. Uh, and this point is coming from a parameter here. So this was called x bar. But x bar is the image through phi, through phi of a parameter. So let me call it. So now everything is considered as a function of uh, s and sigma. OK, so x of s. Is it clear? Uh, OK. This is very convenient. It is convenient to have a fixed parameter space in a flat, uh, um, in a flat parameter space Rn minus 1. And then I have an orthogonal, say, component S, which is the time of parameterization of each, of each orbit. In the physical space, I'm starting from here. This is a point x bar. is coming from here. And then my, my orbits, uh, of the, my, my vector field was, by the way, transverse. So my, my vector field was transverse here. Yeah? And then my capital X are just uh, curves, integral curves of the, of the vector field. OK, this was the situation at the level of Rn. OK. Now, let me write this uh, PD slightly differently, in a, of course, equivalent way. Uh, Cu minus f equal to 0. Or maybe let me write it in an obvious equivalent way. Uh, minus uh, f minus Cu equal to 0. What is written here? is that the scalar product, now, now uh, again, we have to be a little bit, um, we have to understand on the role of the symbol. I mean, this dot is the scalar product in R capital N, OK? Now, now let me, let me uh, write this. B um, against grab u minus 1 equal to 0, where now b is equal to b f minus cu. Namely, more precisely, b of x and y is a new vector field with one component, b of x, f of x minus c of x, y. Hmm? So this is Rn, in Rn, this is scalar. Hmm? And so given B, F, and C, I can introduce a new vector field in a higher dimensional space. So in plus one. OK? So capital B now is a vector field consisting of a horizontal component which is this, n-dimensional, and the vertical component, which is a number. Hmm? OK, so I'm increasing the dimension because of u, essentially. And uh, so uh, and, and then I, it's somehow natural to, to, to define this capital B. This dot here now is the, um, is the dot in our n plus 1. Hmm? Sorry for the same notation, dot in our n, dot in our n plus 1. But it is clear. Okay. So you see now that this is 
this can be written, the scalar product, capital B is now B and this, and now against this new object, gradu minus one. And you see that, you see that this is equivalent clearly to this. Hmm? Do you agree? But now this is a geometric condition on the graph of U. On the graph of U. So maybe it is better that I'm trying to do a sort of, uh, of picture. So remember, this picture is at the level of Rn. Now I have to make a picture in Rn plus 1. So I erase this, but you have to, to understand what I'm doing. <laughs> so. Uh, now I need the picture in Rn plus one. Okay, so, so let, I, I will try to do this in a sort of uh, understandable way. If you don't understand, please let me know that we try to adjust the the, the picture. Okay, so I try. So now, so here we have the variable y. Okay. Now I'm taking, say, n equal to 2, maybe. Hmm? And this is sigma. Sigma was yellow, so this is sigma. OK? So for, the, for simplicity, sigma is just a piece of hyperplane. In this case, we are in two dimensions, so n minus 1 is 1. So this is a piece of line. It's not curved anymore for simplicity. You should think about a curve here. But for simplicity, for making the picture, I take just a piece of line. OK. Now we have, remember, the vector field B that here it is uh, horizontal. OK. So and this transverse to. So this is the vector field in the horizontal plane. It was v b, small b. So let me, this was b. Omega is here. Hmm? Somewhere here in this horizontal plane. OK? So the previous picture, which was in the, in the blackboard, now must be imagined in this horizontal plane. OK, this is the, the important thing. The previous picture very, uh, above of you now becomes a picture in the horizontal plane. OK, so now this is B in the horizontal plane transverse to sigma. And we, we have uh, um, over this, we have over this, we have the graph of U-bar. U-bar was the initial condition. OK. OK. So now let us try to the, to the, to depict the capital B now. What is the vector field cap capital B? So we are now in, in one dimension more. So uh, B of x, y is equal to B of x, f of x minus C of x, y. So we see the capital B is some, somewhere here around this. The horizontal part of capital B is the same as small b. Hmm? But then there is a, some, a, some sort of vertical part also. So maybe capital B is a, a, has a sort of vertical part. So say, I don't know, something like this. OK? By the way, capital B is non-vertical. I mean, B is never 0. So uh, this is never vertical like this, capital B. And moreover, it is uh, capital B 
restricted to the gra this graph is non-tangent to the graph. Hmm? This capital B, I, re I repeat, if I look at it just, capital B is defined everywhere in this big space. I am interested in it locally around this. Hmm? But if I restrict it on this uh, graph, the graph of the initial uh, condition, this is non-tangent because b small b was uh, transverse to sigma. It's non-tangent to, to the graph of u bar, capital B. Hmm? OK. What this equation is saying, what is this? So the u is a solution now. Assume that we have a solution. We have constructed it, by the way. OK? Uh, what is saying this condition? Can you see it? What is this in terms of the graph of the solution u? Hmm? Is, the, is a normal vector. Maybe it's not of length 1, because this is not normalized. But it is parallel to the normal to the graph of u. OK? So minus grad u. So remark, my, uh, minus grad u 1 is parallel to to a normal vector to the graph of u. Hmm? So this equation imposes something. It imposes that uh, b is tangent to the graph of u. Capital B, tan this says capital B orthogonal to the normal. Equivalently, capital B tangent to the graph of u. OK, so b tangent to graph u on graph u. Hmm? So our solution u must be equal to u bar on sigma. And then must have a graph such that capital B is tangent to, its, to this graph. So let, I'm trying to now maybe to, uh, to uh, I don't know if this is clear or not. This is local part of the graph of the solution U. So this is capital B, uh, this is capital B, and this is the graph of U. So this graph is obtained as a union of, of curves which are essentially integral curves. So let me rewrite the x dot equal to b of x, y dot equal to f of x minus c of x, y. Huh? So the solution to this, they are, they, they are curves into Rn plus 1. Uh, and you see that the tangent to these curves is exactly the vector field capital B. So these are the integral curves of the vector field capital B. Huh? Because this is, this, the right hand side is capital B. Huh? So these are the tangent vector to the curves. Tangent equal capital B. So this means that the, the curve has a tangent direction, which is capital B. And therefore, the, the graph of the solution is just the union of these curves. So the point of the, so there is a geometric interpretation. So you have given this graph. And you want to find another. So this is, however, co-dimension 2, because this is a curve in R3. 
And then you look for a surface in R3, which meet this part because you have to start from here. So you have to touch sigma, this graph of u, because initially you have the condition this. And then you have to, to, to have this property that the, 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 the tangent, uh, that the vector field capital B is tangent to, to the manifold, to the red manifold, which would be the graph of the solution that we have defined. <laughs> Okay, so this is the so graph of you. Gra no, this is no sorry, this is graph of you. No. no, this is graph of the initial condition. And then this is the graph of you. Okay, this is the geometric uh, interpretation of our first order PD. This is maybe, so is it clear? Now it's, it's not so easy. Eh? The important is at the end the transversality condition of B here so that we can really somehow, starting from this curve, continue it in the surface, into a surface with proper, properly with suitable properties. Hmm? Everything? I mean, you can ignore this geometric picture and solve the characteristic systems. But maybe it is better to have also this in mind to do both at the same time. Hmm? Is it okay for the moment? Okay, this is important because this is the starting point of the next nonlinear PD. So we pass now to a, another case, more general. Um, that we write this as follows. So if this is clear, I can continue. I know it is not easy. I know that this system of characteristics is not easy. In particular, this map uh, that you have to invert, but anyway. So now let, let us now continue by considering the following more general PD. So let my notations are this. Now I from 1 to n, bi of x, no, bi of x and u of x now, times uh, du over dxi of x. OK, and this, this must be equal to f of x, u of x. So now this is a non-trivial generalization of the previous case because our coefficients now depend on u and not only on x. And therefore, uh, the equation is non-linear anymore. Hmm? Maybe this is called quasi-linear because at the end, you see, the coefficients depend on u, but they do not depend I mean, the nonlinearity is due of this. It's not, that, it's not the case that you have the, the, the higher order derivative square, for instance. This is not the case. So this is called quasi-linear, not really linear, but, but not nonlinear in the higher derivative. Let me say like this. So if, if you look, if you f f uh, freeze this, this is still linear in the higher derivative. Huh? Mm. However, global is nonlinear in U because the typical case, as I told you, is in the other way time space. The typical case that you have to consider is, is this, say. Mm. Okay. And this, is a, this has also a name. Maybe the, the, another way to rewrite is it. it uh, it is um, this now. So uh, it is nonlinear. Let, let us write it like this. However, it has a sort of divergent structure now. Hmm? Very convenient. This has a name that we will study a little bit. It is called the Burgers equation.
Of course, this equation is a particular case of this. Okay? So let us try to say something about this. Okay? Okay. Okay, so um, So we have the previous notation on the diffeomorphism, the map, the embedding map phi, and so on. And so what are now the uh, assumption, transversality assumption? Because now if you look at the system of characteristics, system of characteristics now is this B of x and y, y dot equal f of x and y. Uh, and then there are the initial conditions. So uh, x of 0 is equal to sum of phi of sigma, and y of 0 is equal to sum u bar of sum of phi of sigma. OK? So this is now the system of characteristics. Okay, this gives us, if we are able to solve it, gives us solution x of s and sigma and y of s and sigma. Okay. Now, which is the different the difference between this system of characteristics and the previous the linear case. Well, we can see it. These are coupled now, really, they, they are coupled. Because in the previous case, first we solved for capital X, and then we found Y once we know capital X. Hmm? Because in the previous case, Y was not present here. In the linear case, there were, there were no Y. So, so this was depending just only on x. We solve it, and then we put it here, x, and we solve for y. This was the previous idea. Hmm? But now you see what happens. In the nonlinear case, unfortunately, we cannot really do this, because now b depends also on y. So they are really, uh, I mean, uh, entangled. <laughs> they are really. Uh, not coupled, uh, you cannot decouple so easily, at least. Can you see? So uh, since now uh, here there, there is both x and y, and here there is both x and, x and y, so this is a system, and you have to, to see each time what, uh, what, what you can do. Hmm? So now we assume on, uh, on B, F, and whatever, that we have a local smooth solution to this system, OK? No, we assume that B say C1, uh, F is C1, uh, phi is C1, uh, everything is C1. So we have a local solution. We are not interested in the difficult case of, of uh, this continuous uh, right-hand side. We don't. So we have a local solution. But anyway, what is the, the point is, what can we say? How can we, how, uh, how, how can we, uh, can we, uh, state the transversality condition which in the previous case was just at the horizontal level. Previous case was B transverse to sigma. Now B depends on X and Y. And so what do we do? Well, it is natural in my opinion to uh, to in view of the previous discussion, to say that on graph of u bar, capital B is non-tangent. Hmm? Can you remember the previous discussion? We observed that this condition in the linear case was also saying that this was not tangent to the, the horizontal part of capital B was not tangent. So we take as a transversality assumption that uh, we take the, uh, the, that uh, 
b of x y is non tangent on graph of u bar on graph of u bar okay so meaning that when you put here u bar of x u bar of phi of sigma say then this vector field just uh, read on this is non tangent okay fine uh, now again our solution I claim that our solution is again in the usual form so I claim that uh, I can construct one solution one local C1 solution again by this formula u of x is equal to uh, is equal to y of s of x sigma of x so claim one solves our Okay. The claim is this. So the usual formula. In this more general case, even nonlinear. Okay. I claim that, and still we have the change of variable and so on, etc., etc. Et so given x, we have s of x and sigma of x, and the claim is that uh, this uh, this uh, solves the PD. Uh, before doing, trying to do this computation, let me write more explicitly what does it mean uh, imposing this, uh, non -transverse, this transversality condition. So the, this transversality condition, so I'm sorry, now I have to erase the picture. So let me erase it. This can be uh, checked as follows. So, which is the basis for the tangent space to sigma at a point? Huh? So you have sigma. Now, now I'm coming back to the uh, to the previous picture, huh? the picture number one, not number two. So this is sigma. Um, or maybe it's not, it's not really even necessary to do. So which is the basis for the, for the tangent space to, uh, to, to sigma? You have a parametrizing embedding map, cap, uh, phi. Phi is an embedding. So which is the tangent space? Which is uh, the a basis at each point for the tangent space? Phi is given. So we have given phi. Remember, phi takes some u into Rn and is a local parametrization for sigma. Well, you have, this is in R n minus 1. Phi, what do you mean by phi prime? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, say d phi over d sigma 1, let me write it like this. d phi over d sigma uh, n minus 1. Uh, this is a tangent vector. Phi, say, remember, phi is phi 1, phi n is OK. Because phi goes from here into a big space, Rn. So phi has n components hmm, and n minus 1 um, variables. So I take, say, R2 into R3. I take a piece of R2 into R3, and then it becomes a piece of surface. OK, this is phi. <coughs> 
And then I have this piece of first surface physically a point here. Then I want to, to find the tangent space in the physical space. This is generated by two vectors because it's two-dimensional now. And each of them is the derivative of the embedding map uh, um, with respect to one of the or one its variable, okay? The point is that if I look parameterization, if I now I have using the language of parameterization, I can think that I have a parameter here and I talk about the tangent space here as being the tangent space in the image. Hmm? But this is an embedding, I can identify this with its image. Anyway, so uh, this is a tangent vector at the image point. Hmm? The entries of this are points here, of course. But this physically has a meaning of the tangent, the tangent vector at the image point. Hmm? This is just first uh, elementary effect in differential geometry. Okay. So this is a tangent vector. This is another tangent vector. So these are n minus 1 tangent vectors. Assumptions of phi embeddings, immersion, it says that these are linearly independent. This is an assumption. When I write, when, I, when you see what does it mean to being a, a surface, a hypersurface, this means exactly that these objects are literally independent in a, in a neighborhood of your point, okay? So this generates, the, in, any, in, any, in other words, this generates the tangent space. So now I want that this is non-tangent on graph U bar. So now I take the matrix, the phi over this sigma 1, comma, comma. This, this is a column, column. I have n minus 1 column, but the column has n components. So I have, I have to take a square matrix n my times n. So d phi over d sigma 1, d phi over d sigma n minus 1. And then I have b of um, sigma. Uh, u bar phi of sigma, okay, and I have this big matrix. Hmm? Okay, and uh, this, this big matrix, so now it, it is suddenly it is n times n, no? Because this is uh, another vector with n components. So n minus 1 plus 1, we have n columns. So this is a square matrix. And saying that this is non-tangent means that this must be, the determinant of this must be different from 0. Okay? So this is a way to say that for any sigma in U, say, it's our new transversality condition, a little bit more difficult than the previous one. So this is the new form of the transversality condition. So maybe it is better to try to do an exercise because maybe it's not so easy to understand this. So before doing the computation of the, before proving our claim, let us do a, an exercise together. Because I, I mean, so, so the exercise would be the following. So b this is after the exercise. I, I leave this after the exercise. Or maybe if we have no time, because we do the exercise, I leave you as homework that we will do together tomorrow at the beginning if you, we don't have time. Okay, so but, but before doing this, let, let us do the exercise just to understand what we are doing. Maybe it is slightly better. So uh, the exercise is the following. Uh, solve u du over dx1 plus du over dx2 is equal to 1. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so this is x1, this is x2. And then on this sigma. u equal to u bar.
okay? And u bar is equal also to what? Uh, maybe u bar is non... Uh, yes, u bar is equal to... Ah, uh, yes. u bar of sigma is given also. Initial condition is one half of sigma. So, which is the situation? Let, let's, let us try to understand. First of all, this is, if you could, ch if you ch change num name to, to the variable, this is du over dt, du over dt, plus u, the u over dx, equal to one, so this is Berger's equation. Hmm? du over dt plus u, ux, equal one. Hmm? If you call x2 equal to t, Remember that Burgers is ut plus u, ux equal to something, equal to something. So if you call this ut, this is u, ux, when x is one dimensional. In, in, uh, so anyway, this is, and, but usually ut plus u, x, ux is coupled with a condition on sigma, which is, and sigma is uh, time zero. So now we have a slightly different situation because Sigma is not here, but it is here. So now, which is, let, let us try to uh, slowly understand this example so that I think that you can understand better the role of the symbols. So first of all, we are in, of course, n is equal to 2. This is clear. Hmm? So sigma is an hypersurface in R2, of course because it's, it's a segment, so it's one dimensional in R2. So sigma is, okay, one dimensional. And of course, it's a smooth hypersurface. Obvious, it's a segment, so more smooth than a segment is impossible. So uh, U bar, now, who is phi? We have to find the embedding map. So this is our manifold sigma in the physical space. But we need the embedding map, phi. So we need an open set contained in R, because n minus 1 is R. Hmm? And we need the map phi, the map phi. Who is phi taking? Who is capital U and who is phi? Omega is. Uh... Uh, omega, omega is, is something in R2, is something here around, say. It's an open set like sort of this. Okay, this is omega. Can you check U is uh, the path from 0 to 1? Of course. U is equal, say, 0, 1. So this is the parameter space. And now, so phi must go to from 0 to 1 into R2. And must the image of phi must be your sigma. OK? OK, so the parameter we call this sigma. Now? Sigma, sigma. Sigma, sigma. Do you agree? Obviously. Uh, you take any point in this interval into a point on sigma. Is it a parameterization, regular parameterization? Of course, if I differentiate this with respect to sigma, this is 1, 1. Therefore, it's never 0. Therefore, the Jacobian is rank, maximal rank. In this case, it's just the, the matrix is just a number, 1 times 1 matrix, trivial. It's non-zero matrix. The parameterization is regular. And the vector 1, 1 generates the tangent space, obviously. So this is a very simple case, just one dimensional, OK? But just to, to understand. Hmm? Is, it, is it clear? It's a little bit clear. Is it, is, is it clear? 
not this one. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm trying to do first the exercise so that the, if you understand the exercise, then you can translate uh, the claim or, or, or the theory looking first at the exercise step by step. Because in the, in the, in the theory, sigma is, is an n minus one dimensional object into our n. So it's much more difficult. And you have an embedded map which has several components and so on and so forth. So anyway, let, let us try to understand at least this example. Okay. Now, uh, let us check uh, our transversality condition. So the determinant of what? Now, we have already computed this. We have just one here because n minus 1 is equal to 1. So there is just this. Ah, b. I have not written who is b, maybe. OK, so b of x and y, sorry. Who is b of x and y? Y, y. OK, is it clear? It is clear, because if I remember, I have to write b of x, u of x, b1, u over dx1 plus b2, x, u of x, b u over dx2 equal to 1. So if b1 of x and y is equal y, I get exactly this product. Huh? And if B2 of x and y is equal 1, I have exactly this 1 here. Is it clear? Hmm? So uh, B of x and y is this. Hmm? Now I, I can write it also capital B. We don't need it, actually, capital B. But capital B is uh, one, uh, y, one, one, maybe. But we don't need, for the moment, capital B. Hmm? OK, so let us write down the, ortho the um, transversality condition. Transversality condition. So let, so what is this matrix? It's a two by two matri matrix because n is equal to two. And therefore, we know that this is an n times n matrix. Hmm? And therefore, we need a two by two matrix. Hmm? And what is this two by two matrix? Please let, tell me what is this two by two matrix. The first column is. One, one. That is, this is the tangent, the vector um, spanning the tangent space to sigma is just one dimensional. And then I have to write down B of sigma u bar of C, phi of sigma. And u bar is this. U bar of, sorry, u bar of phi of sigma. U bar of phi of sigma. Yes, because u bar is defined, say, at points, physical space, x bar. But x bar is coming from a sigma here. So let me write u bar of phi of sigma, OK? Just to be extremely precise. Very often, one identifies capital U with its image. But if now, if I want to be really very, very precise, I have to not to identify it, considering the embedding map phi and so on. Okay. So, which is the second column of this? Hmm? Exactly, because this is uh, b of x y, so one half sigma and one. Hmm? Uh, is it correct? Let me let me check. B, no, not one. Uh, ah, yes, one. B of, no, B of sigma, yes, u bar of sigma, one, thank you. So now the determinant of this is one minus one half sigma. Hmm? 
and the determinant of this is non-zero for any sigma between 0 and 1 hmm? because our, our u was 0, 1 so this is never 0 in this u 1 minus 1 half sigma ok difference from 0 in our interval 0, 1 Okay, therefore we uh, can start the theory. We have transversality, and we can at least write down the uh, system of characteristics. And so x dot equal to b of x and y, x of 0 equal to some phi of sigma, um, y dot equal to uh, 1, and y of 0 is equal to u bar of phi of sigma and we have to solve this to, to look I mean to, to, to obtain uh, this hmm? okay okay so x dot x1 dot must be equal to y x2 dot must be equal to 1 y dot must be equal to 1 and then we have the initial conditions uh, phi of sigma was uh, phi of sigma was sigma sigma and this was 1 half of sigma right hmm? ok so First of all, x2 of sigma, x2 of s and sigma, by the way, must be equal to s, uh, s, um, x2 equal to 1, x2 of 0 is equal to, so it is s plus sigma. Hmm? Now x1 of s and sigma, ma, um, so y, first of all, y of s and sigma must be equal to, uh, again, s, but now uh, plus one half, sorry, plus one half of sigma. Huh? Okay? And x1 of s and sigma now is uh, y. You see now they are coupled. This is an example where, in which we see exactly the coupling because in, for solving into, for x1, we need to know y. And fortunately, y was independent. Huh? So now we can put y here, which is uh, s plus, so x dot 1 with x plus 1 half 
sigma, this is x dot 1, which gives us also x1 by integration. So x1 of s and sigma equals, sorry, I raise this now. Uh, So which gives us uh, this plus uh, this uh, plus now uh, plus sigma maybe because for uh, for s equal to zero it was sigma right okay we are in a good shape because we have actually we have the map s sigma the explicit map x of s sigma, which is uh, s square over 2 plus 1 half s sigma plus sigma comma s plus sigma. OK? So the point now is that we have to invert it. And there is no time anymore. So please, homework. We will do this at the beginning of the lecture of tomorrow. So if, even if you don't, you're not able to do this, we, we do it tomorrow. So homework, well, write the solution. So invert this, write ux, and then prove the claim. The claim was that, in general, the solution ux is y of s of x sigma of x. Okay? And we will do this tomorrow.